Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jean-Philippe, uh, for inviting me here. OK, already. Uh, right. OK, so um, I would like to start with a quote from uh, one of the heroes of this talk, uh, Kenneth Wilson. So one of the more conspicuous properties of nature is the great diversity of size and length scales in the structure of the world. Um, so this is what the talk is about. <clears throat> what to do when you have a complex system in which you have many scales, and these scales are coupled to each other. So it will be basically a talk about the renormalization group. And uh, I was tricked by Jean-Philippe into thinking that not everybody in the audience knew about the RG. But then yesterday we had a talk by Jim Setton where he just brushed over RG and introduced something even fancier. And then Bill took RG for granted and they introduced a version of RG for neural systems. So uh, I will be the only and true pedestrian today. I hope there is someone in the audience. So raise your hand if you don't know the RG or pretend to not to know. Thank you. OK, thank you very much, my guy. So it's really a tale about scales. And uh, scales are at the very core of what I do, which is uh, studying complex systems, sorry, collective uh, system in, in, in biology. Um, and uh, collective behavior crosses many different scales. Okay, so this is the first, um, uh, is the first issue about scales. So from the microscopic scale, these are stem cells, uh, colony growing. Um, you can scale up, these are swarms of midges, and I'm sorry, I will talk about this mostly today, not birds, I'm very sorry. Uh, but of course, uh, there is birds as well, and this was on the poster of the symposium, so certainly they must have their slide. Um, so, crossing many scales, but there is another and more important issue for what we are going to talk about today, which is the fact that when you have uh, many agents individuals, so when really more is different, uh, you have many scales. You can talk about having many scales. And these scales may be coupled to each other, and then the system becomes very complex to study. So how do we tame such complexity normally? Well, if you're a physicist, you do that by doing outrageously minimal models, really what I won't emphasize outrageously. and. Um, like, at the end of the talk, I will introduce something like that. So those equations may seem complicated, but it's actually three equations. Uh, and I will claim that I can uh, you know, describe every flock of every species, in, and then also swarms, insects, and so on, with just those three equations. So this is the kind of misbehavior which really creates a gap, a chasm with other communities. And because then, well, I have to do a lot with with biologists, and they say, OK, yeah, sure, right. So, so you uh, forget the whole complexity of the system, the great diversity, heterogeneities. There are males and females, and young and old birds. And so how can you, how are you there doing that? So if you read our papers, sooner or later you find sentences like that. Microscopic details do not matter much when large-scale structure emerge in the system. Well, OK, the problem is, says who? It's a nice idea, it would be nice if that were true, but uh, I mean, who's going to tell you that microscopic details do not matter much? Well, the answer is the renormalization group says so. Can I just so, ask, in the, since you were showing the birds and so on, the boundary conditions, you need to put an extra, extra thing, no? Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> well, I mean, if I look at those, it's the, it seems like everything is the boundaries and how things break up and so on, and the bit in the middle on which they are, the less boring. Well, so it's the collective, the whole thing. But for that, you, you can't just do it from. I didn't pay attention. Right? <laughs> well, let's say I will not speak much about birds today. So let me go through the, this pedagogical part. But yes, there is a problem with boundary condition. Depends <laughs> and when you do simulation, when you do the. Let's say that the RG I will do today will be in the bulk. Okay, so I will not care about boundary condition. But certainly, for example, there is a problem with boundary condition when you inference. So what you do about the birds at the boundary, will you take them as fixed uh, uh, spins or so on? So yes, there is an issue with boundary conditions. So there is an issue with boundary conditions. Um, so the renormalization group was the pinnacle of a, a remarkable effort by a bunch of remarkable people uh, between the 60s and the 70s, that century. Uh, these people were puzzled, but at the same time uh, uh, extremely fascinated by one experimental fact. That is that if you're interested in the longer uh, scale behavior and the large scale behavior 
of a system, then you find that apparently very different systems uh, like uh, fluids, ferromagnets, uh, um, binary mixture and so on, they are described by exactly the same laws. So they've got the same sets of critical exponents. So this was very puzzling and very fascinating. At the end, they cracked the problem, and uh, DRG was uh, the solution of this problem. Uh, one of these people, Kenneth Wilson, ended up winning the Nobel Prize for that. And he wrote this uh, fantastic paper, which I strongly recommend to you if you want to read a paper, an introductory paper about the RG. And so my aim today is to try and convince you that uh, this is something which is relevant also beyond, uh, maybe also beyond just physics. Okay, so more is different. So uh, among the many things which are different when you put more degrees of freedom is that you can go from just having one scale to having many, many scales. So when you have many scales in your system, yes, the system is more difficult, but you're not automatically screwed. Because in some cases, uh, the different scales do not interact much with each other. So system uh, phenomena happening at one scale do not communicate much with phenomena happening at another scale. And in that case, you can study the scales independently from each other. Maybe they're weakly interacting. This is, for example, what happens in a Gaussian model. So this is the easy case. I'm not saying that the system, the, the degrees of freedom are not interacting. They are interacting, but in a way that scales are not interacting with each other, not communicating. They're not coupled to each other. But the more interesting case, and the, the, the very complex one, is when different scales are coupled to each other. So they talk to each other, so there is a communication and interaction between scales. So that is the, is the very tough case. So uh, the reaction of the uh, renormalization group uh, uh, to this is uh, more or less what we already seen in many talks, especially yesterday. OK, we have this many scales. Uh, there are so many. Maybe not all of them are useful, so let's eliminate some of the scales. And the idea of RG is say, OK, let's start eliminating the short scale details. Why the short scale details? Well, because typically those are the most different from between different systems, right? So, so I'm studying birds, and they have starlings, and then they have downlings, and they're very different from each other. And uh, so let's try to eliminate the small scale details. And uh, admittedly, the small scale details can be very different. So to uh, illustrate this point, I will use as, a, as an example, which is a metaphor. It's 90% metaphor, 10% science, let's say. Uh, Google Maps, in particular two cities, Bangkok and London, and uh, let's focus on worshipping, so on temples. So we have a Buddhist temple on the left, uh, whose name is uh, that one, a Christian temple on the right, whose name is that one. And this is a very short scale. Well, you can go even shorter, you can get into the temple and you find a beautiful statue of Buddha on the left. and. Uh, a, a very beautiful painting of, of Christ and Buddha on the right, but let's say at this scale, and they are very different. Difference in you know, architecture, colors, uh, structure, and especially a difference in the history leading to that. That is the interaction of the system and the dynamics of the system producing those two things. So the reaction of the RG to this is, okay, let's zoom out of this. So let's uh, watch at the system from a larger scale. So if we zoom out, this is what happens. So this is the main message of the talk. Okay, so we started from this short scale. And we ended up here, large scale. And if I didn't waste one week on Google Maps, the <laughs> take home message should be that the differences here are much stronger than the difference at this scale. So more or less, at a very qualitative level, this is what we mean in physics when we say that macroscopic details do not matter much when we are interested in the large scale behavior of the system. But if you are, for example, Boris Johnson, you may say, Westminster Abbey is still there, isn't it? So it, this is just a trick. You just zoom out. You didn't do anything. You just rescale length. Well, Boris probably wouldn't use rescale as a, as a terminology, but <laughs> some of you would say you did nothing. You just rescaled length. And for some funny reason related to you know, the resolution of your laptop, the screen, and so on, I can't see Westminster anymore, but it's still there. The details are still there. Well, are they? So is Westminster Abbey still there? So let's zoom back and see what happens. 
So, in fact, it's not there anymore. <laughs> so Westminster Abbey is gone, so you have really obliterated, so integrated out the short scale details. And this is a very important point. So zooming out, which is apparently a very familiar experience for all of us, uh, you know, after Google Maps, uh, is actually made of two steps. So let's see these two steps on Piazza Navona in Rome. So the first step is uh, you coarse grain. So you have some um, original resolution here, so you see the pixels here. And you coarse grain meaning that you do some local averages of some blocks, some plaquettes of pixels. And so you produce a coarse grain images of that uh, where the <laughs> pixels are larger. And this is the first step. So this is really where you lose information. You're not rescaling, you're just integrating out small scale details. And then you rescale. So you get out, right? So you rescale of length. Uh, but you have already lost information. So this process is, you know, is irreversible. So when you actually zoom in in Google Maps, it's because they have stored all the high resolution images uh, and they give them back to you, right? So but when you see people zooming in uh, in uh, TV series with the CIA, that is completely bogus. I mean, if you don't have that resolution, you cannot make it up, right? So you can scale up, uh, zoom out, but you cannot zoom in by recovering that information. And uh, what we've done can be appreciated more if we zoom uh, again on, on one small detail, like the Fontana dei Fiumi here. So we didn't have a great resolution uh, uh, to begin with, but then what we did was to average, for example, average uh, all the pixels in these 4x4 plaquettes and associate to each 4x4 plaquette just one big pixel. And this is the coarse graining. So in doing this, your smaller resolution, the lattice spacing A changes, becomes larger, and then you rescale in such a way to have the same lattice spacing, okay? And uh, this is an RG transformation. The question then is, what is good in losing information on the short scale? You have case? to do a rescaling of your contrast here also. Well, I didn't do any contrast rescaling here, actually. Uh, but uh, I mean, you should rescale the field, right? This is what, uh, is what you're selling? Yeah. I mean, that was one of the things which Kadanov missed. Yeah, okay. Here I'm not doing that, and I agree. There are many other details. I'm just focusing on these two things. But yes, you have to rescale the field, and you have to rescale the parameters, and you have to you have a flow that I will try to explain later. But here I'm just doing this. I'm just coarse graining and uh, rescaling by using graphing converter. Uh, so what is good in losing information with the short scale? Well, the fact is that the smaller features are blurred, but the largest ones are unaffected. So the new system has the same large scale properties as the original one, but with all finer scale fluctuations eliminated. Okay, these are more or less the, the words of Wilson in his paper. But then your question could be, okay, I understand that. So you have a new system which is the same at the larger scale, but because it's the same at the larger scale as the old one, again, why did you do that? Okay, I understand, I lost information, I have the same physical larger scale, so why did they do that? So, in answering this question in that uh, uh, general article on Scientific American, I have to say that Wilson is kind of uh, not very straightforward. It's like he's not trusting his audience uh, to give the real reason. So he say, among other things, uh, well, because in doing this, uh, you're reducing the number of variables, you're reducing the number of degrees of freedom, so the system is easier. Which is true, but it's not the real deep reason. So why are we doing that? What is the deep reason for doing this? The deep reason is that the new blur system has new interactions. So this is the most important point, and I think that this is the point where, which is missed by uh, different fields like in biology and in economics, where the ideas are similar, so let's coarse grain, uh, integrating out variables, but this of having a system with new couplings is really what was, in my opinion, the, 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 the normal step forward. So the idea is that we are not interested in just one photograph, of course. We're interested in the probability distribution generating uh, that configuration. And the probability distribution is parameterized by some couplings, meaning that there are couplings between the variables. OK, he, this is just a metaphor, but you have to imagine that in a real system, you have a coupling between the, the, the pixels, right, between the, the, the variables of the system. So when you do this transformation, so when you blur and rescale, uh, then you have a new system, you remember, with different pixel, larger pixel, okay? It's very reasonable to expect that that system has its own dynamics, so it has its own couplings between the new degrees of freedom. So the question is then, 
are these coupling the same as before, or have they changed? So in some cases, uh, the couplings are the same. And those are exactly the same cases I was telling you before, the easy ones, where you don't have connection between the different length scales. So in, in this case, uh, integrating out the short scale details doesn't have any impact on the larger scale details. But this is not what typically happens. In the more complex cases, which are also the most interesting, which is when scales are interacting, then the coupling of the new systems are different. They changed. And this is the most important point, because it means that you actually have a new system with a new probability distribution with new couplings. And then if you iterate this transformation, so you blur and rescale and blur and rescale, then you have a sequence of systems. So you have what we call a flow, a flow in the space of systems. And this is the uh, kind of mystical RG flow. And this is my Google Maps visualization of an RG flow. So London flows. So you coarse grain and rescale, and it flows. It moves in this space. Bangkok flows. Uh, Rome flows when you zoom out of the Campidoglio Square. Paris flows when you zoom out of the Louvre. And they move. And this is the turning point. In some cases, all these flows, they go to just one fixed point, so to the same system, which is a system describing the large scale uh, physics of all these original cities. Okay? So this is the, is the key idea of the, of, of, uh, of the RG. And this is what we call a universality class then. So this is no longer just London, Bangkok, Rome, or Paris. It's just the universality class of, let's say, city with a river. I like okay. the fact that the university class is Paris. So you spotted that. OK. <laughs> that was, you know, I'm in Paris. So, OK. <laughs> OK, thank you for that. Uh, OK, so this is the final idea of the RG. The same RG fixed points rules the large scale behavior of system with different short scale details. This is universality. So this is why we do toy models, because we have in the back of our mind this idea. Of course, the problem is, does it work? Especially, does it work in biology, in the system which I study? Because you know, many things can go wrong. So uh, one thing is the idea behind it. The other thing is applying it. So what we've been doing is to try to apply this uh, kind of, uh, uh, of machinery to um, biological collective systems, in particular to uh, swarms, swarms of midges. These are data from our lab. But we have data also uh, from flocks. And uh, so these are the kind of system that, that we are studying. And uh, the first point is, OK, but do they qualify as system where you uh, should try to use this machinery? Well, the idea is yes, because the system we study are characterized by strong correlations. And strong spatial correlation is basically another way to say what I told you before, that you have coupling between the different scales of the systems, right? So if you, uh, these are the, the velocity, uh, well, the, the two-dimensional projector, the velocity in the real flock of birds, uh, if you compute velocity fluctuations, uh, you see that there are large correlated regions, okay? Xi is what we call the correlation length. So this large correlation is exactly uh, what happens uh, when you have that many scales are coupled to each other. This happens in all our flocks. And uh, if you say, OK, how large is this correlation length? What you find is that actually the correlation length scales with the system size. So this is really one of the systems where you should use RG. And this is true in flux, but it's also true in swarms, which I will study today. And there is more. There are also strong correlations in time. So the systems are strongly correlated in space and strongly correlated in times. And the two things are connected to each other. And I think that this is very important because uh, in what I do, we have the luxury to having space. But in many cases, uh, you, you don't have that luxury, so you don't have space. But almost invariably, you have time. Uh, and so the fact that you can apply this also when you have strong correlations in time is very important. But in our case, we have both. And what we find is that space and times are entangled. So the relaxation time of our system scales uh, as a power law. Well, it's a very short interval, but case with a, a correlation length. So this uh, idea that tau scales like psi to some exponent is what we call critical slowing down in, in statistical physics. It is something quite deep. It's telling you that 
uh, the two, these two fundamental quantities, space and time, they actually scale with each other. And the small number regulating this law is what we call the dynamical critical exponent z. So we have measured that in natural swarms, and we find this value, this is experimental value, 1.2 plus minus 0.1. So then, can we predict the dynamical critical exponent using the RG? This is what uh, we asked ourselves. So we have this number. Do we have, can we do a theory for that? So the idea is that now, faithful to what I told you before, I'm not uh, giving any very specific details of the theory because I think that they should not matter, right? I'm just giving you the very general ingredients of the theory. And there are just three very general ingredients of the theory I will apply the RG to. The first ingredient is imitation. So what imitation does, well, basically, here we're talking about collective motion, so your uh, direction of motion is a big deal. So the idea, the first idea is, okay, try to go in the same direction as your neighbors. So try to do whatever your neighbors are doing. And this simple, uh, in, um, this simple ingredient imitation, so these are uh, small arrows with fixed modulus, uh, is what started it all, because it's what we call uh, a ferromagnetic system in statistical physics, and the original RG was developed for, for these kind of systems. So you write a very simple equation, which you say, okay, how much do I change my direction of motion? Well, to change my direction of motion, I look at my neighbors. So Nij is the interaction matrix, which is something local. I only interact with my nearest neighbors. U0 is the strength of the interaction, how strongly I, I, I interact, plus some noise. So the point is, do I need to know U0 to have Z? Well, no, because U0 is one of those couplings I was telling you before. So if I do an RG analysis of this, this was the original RG analysis of uh, Wilson and Fisher in 72, I find a fixed point. And if I do the dynamical RG analysis of this, uh, I find a critical exponent, which is Z equal to 2. So Z equal to 2 is quite far from what we find. These are critical exponents. So small changes in a critical exponent normally mean a big deal, OK? Uh, so clearly, there is something missing. So imitation alone doesn't do the trick. But clearly, there was it's something enormous missing, the fact that these are not simply stationary uh, uh, arrows aligning to each other. These guys are going around. They're moving. So clearly, the second ingredient is activity. So uh, activity means that if you are interacting with your neighbor, so at some instant of time, Luke is interacting with Obi-Wan, but everybody, and is not interacting with Yoda, for example, and, but everybody is moving, uh, and so, uh, well, actually, Obi-Wan dies, but anyway, so everybody is moving, so they move. So the next step, you could have that Obi-Wan just left the building, and Yoda got into the interaction range. So what happens that the interaction uh, uh, matrix changed in time. So Nij is now an Nij of t. So you do basically the same thing as before. This is exactly the same equation as before. You imitate the direction of motion of your neighbors. But now you say you move. And you move following your direction of motion. And you have a new parameter, which is basically the speed. So now v naught times sigma is your velocity. So you started from a steady, a standard, a fixed ferromagnets, but now everybody is just following their own uh, direction of motion. And this was uh, a very important model introduced by Vixen co-workers in 95. So uh, it took some time to apply the RG to this model, but it was done finally by Chen, Toner, and Lee in 2015. And uh, so we have one new uh, variable on the RG uh, plane, which is activity. So we have activity and alignment. Uh, and they found a new fixed point. So again, all the points in this plane would be a different model. But there are just a couple of important points, which are the fixed point of the RG flow. And the new fixed point has a smaller critical exponent. So we are going in the right direction. Remember, we have to go from 2 to 1.3. Uh, however, again, 1.7 is better than before, but still quite far from the experimental result. So something is still missing. And this is the, the third ingredient that we have to, well, we decided to put in, which was inertia. So it would be hard to explain this in, in, in very simple terms. So let me use this. Uh, these systems are strongly correlated, but correlation uh, can be uh, a statistical correlation is just a static uh, property. 
The important point is that across this system, normally you also have to transfer information. And the way you transfer information is something similar from the qualitative point of view to a domino wave, okay? Uh, for example, a perturbation arrives, a predator arrives on one side of the flock, and they have to turn, and you want that turning wave to propagate effectively. So uh, this kind of uh, wave of information depends on many parameters, okay, like in the domino case, but two parameters are very important, and the two parameters are inertia and viscosity. And these two quantities are typically natural enemies in physics. Actually, you always find them one on top of each other, the ratio between inertia and viscosity. Okay? They, are, they work against each other. So if you have uh, a large inertia and small viscosity, you have something like that. Because remember, inertia is certainly the resistance to start moving. But once you are in motion, inertia is also the resistance to stop moving. This is very important. So what happens if you have a domino wave, but now you increase viscosity or decrease inertia? So you increase the ratio between viscosity and inertia. It was very painful to browse you know, on uh, YouTube to find underwater domino. At the end, I found, uh, but I found it. So there is this guy. So this is, uh, uh, well, let's assume it's the same uh, uh, mass of the, of, of, of the blocks, but it's underwater. So you have larger friction. And so you see it's much sluggish. And uh, incredibly for me, this even stops. Uh, so, which is making my point perfectly. So, if viscosity dominates over inertia, information may not propagate at all in your system. And this would be a problem for these kind of biological systems. And uh, the, the, the models uh, um, introduced up to now had this problem. So, if you do a simulation of the Vicek model and uh, you turn some bird because he's got some information, you see that you fail to start uh, an overall uh, propagating wave. Because this is an overdamped system. So viscosity is too large with respect to Actually, this was a perfectly overdamped system. So there was no inertial term at all. Okay? So what we did uh, was to try to reinstate uh, inertial dynamics in the system. So we had this kind of dynamics. So dv over dt equal to the social force plus noise, and dr over dt equal velocity. Now, this may look like standard Newton. So you say, what are you saying? You already have an inertia dynamic here, but you don't. Because F, the social force, is the derivative of some generalized Hamiltonian with respect to V, not to R. So the force here is dH over dV. So the variable you have to concentrate on is V. So your basic variable is V. So this is an overdamped equation. So what we did was to go back to an underdamped equation. So we introduced a new variable, which is the momentum, which is the generator of the rotations. And we call it spin. So the idea is that uh, before, the social force directly acted on the velocity, so it was rotating each individual. Now we do something different. We say that the velocity is rotated by the spin, just like in the normal angular momentum uh, uh, setup. And then the, the, the social force acts on the spin. And you may have some friction on the spin and some noise uh, giving back your, your thermal bath. And then you have the activity part. So it's important to understand that the original uh, Vicek model is simply the overdamped limit of this new model. So we reinstated inertia. And if you do this, uh, the effect is great. So you do have propagating uh, linear waves in the system. Uh, like in the original domino. So you really can tra transport information across the system just by putting inertia, which is seen something like counterintuitive. So I add inertia to the system and I propagate information more? Yes, because again, inertia is not only the resistance to start the thing, but it's also the resistance to stop it. Yes? So here the blue guy persuaded all the rest? Yes. Well, persuaded is a big word. He's just yeah, well, sorry. Uh, where is it? Darth Vader comes in. <laughs> so, yeah, we just turned the blue one. So the blue one is controlled by us. And this nearest neighbor interaction. So absolutely nearest neighbor interaction. But it, was, it really is it's like going from the diffusion equation to the D'Alembert equation. I mean, it, this is what we did. 
because then in this case you have a second order equation for the velocity and if you go in spin wave you have a second order equation for the phase. So you have phase double dot uh, minus Laplacian of the phase equals zero. And so you have linear propagation. In the other case, you have one on, only one dot of the phase uh, equal the Laplacian of the phase, which is, uh, uh, is diffusion. Yeah, so we went from diffusion to D'Alembert. So these are our three fundamental ingredients, imitation, activity, and inertia. And I'm not giving you many details of how we implemented that. And, uh, this is the kind of system we want to apply the RG to. And uh, in order to avoid you thinking that I only do you know, RG by using Google Maps, this is the real theory, uh, which is a complicated theory for the velocity and the spin field. So on the left, you have material derivatives, meaning this is the activity part. So this is what you would have also in turbulence, right? Uh, on the right, you have the uh, reversible terms, which has the, are the inertial part. And the irreversible terms, which are the original in the ferromagnetic case, right? So if you didn't have some material derivative here, if you had standard derivative, this would be model G of Halpring and Hohenberg or model E. So a model for uh, superfluidity, basically. But we added the activity. So it's like model G going active or superfluid going active. Hamiltonian is a standard uh, landau ginzburg hamiltonian uh, plus uh, the spin square. So there is no particularly important, uh, anything important going on for the spin at the static level. And we work in the incompressible case. So this was already complicated enough. So we forget about the density. We set the density equal constant. So we have a constraint on the velocity. Otherwise, we would have another field, which would be the density and would be a nightmare. So we have many uh, vertices in the theory. Fortunately, we find that all of them, they have a, an upper critical dimension equal to four, so we can do an epsilon expansion. Uh, uh, we do a one-loop calculation. The calculation is admittedly uh, quite strenuous, so I'm not saying the RG is an easy way to solve things, uh, but uh, we managed doing this. We took three years, but at the end, uh, we found uh, a new fixed point. So a fixed point in which both activity and inertia are relevant. And the value of the critical exponent at the new fixed point is 1.3. So we went from two, just imitation, ferromagnetism, down to 1.7, we added activity, and now down to 1.3 by adding inertia, which is remarkably close to the experimental value. Okay, so we're very happy about that. So we, I will say that we almost nailed it. And uh, that was really an anticlimax. Sorry, say that again. So we, 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 we do that again. Sorry. Sorry. I'm just wondering how does it depend on the dimension G? Like, what do you get for four dimensions? And well, four dimensions, you go to the free theory. Yeah, the, the, the upper critical dimension is four, so it gets two. So upper critical dimension is four for all three districts, including in the toner fixed point, uh, you have an upper critical dimension equal to 2. Yes. Okay. And 1.3 is linear in epsilon. Yes. So, is a, so, so your, what you may be asking is, wow, is a big gap between 2 and 1.3. Uh, OK, the reality is this one. So there is another fixed point I'm not telling you about here. This fixed point is a fixed point in which you have zero activity but inertia. So this is exactly model G fixed point. So the fixed point of antiferromagnetism and superfluid helium. So at that fixed point, which is uh, strongly uh, influenced by the conservation law uh, uh, ignited by this Poisson structure, the critical exponent is 1.5. And by the way, this 1.5 is a non-perturbative result. Because you have a symmetry, the critical exponent then is 1.5 at all order. Even though it was found at the beginning as with the epsilon expansion in one loop, then people realize, uh, uh, well, also Halpern and Hohenberg, but also the Dominicis and Peliti realized it was a non-perturbative exponent. So you should see this as a jump between 1.5 and, and, and 1.3, in a way. The inertia, your inertia is the, associated with the Vs of the, the flying, but not the Vs of no, 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 yeah, exactly. Absolutely no coupling with the fluid here. No, well, no. shouldn't there be a coupling with the fluid? Doesn't that play a role? Well, probably. Well, it depends on the relevant numbers, of course. For birds, maybe not so much. For midges, well, 
we don't know. Let's say one should try to do that, but uh, uh, we didn't. So this is just completely dry. So no coupling with the fluid. Certainly, if you study things like bacteria and cells, you certainly have to couple with the fluid. In this case here, for example, for swarms, uh, we also study the uh, properties of small bubbles in the same environment, because we do the experiments in the field, and we find they have a completely different dynamic. So it seems that uh, even midges, they have enough energy to really contrast the effect of the fluid uh, in a way to be almost independent, but we don't know. We, they, they, they could be a coupling like that. And, uh, well, for example, the, the difference between the 1.3 and the 1.2, I don't know, it could be going to the next order, it could be the coupling with the fluid. It could be that our experimental systems are not large enough. Typically, when you have systems which are not large enough, you underestimate Z. So it could be that if you could, we could do an experiment with 10,000 midges, this is, uh, this is a result with, midges, with swarms up to 1,000 midges, more or less. So yeah, coupling with the fluid could be uh, the next step. And, by the way, zero fitting parameters here. So this is what is great of RG. So I didn't fit anything. There is no, no, absolutely no input from the data. Well, apart from the qualitative one, yes. Understanding, for example, that you needed to put inertia because otherwise you didn't have a, a propagating wave. Okay, fine, but those are all uh, qualitative ingredients that you put in by saying, well, you're scratching your head and saying, okay, let's write this theory. But the theory has many parameters, right? But we didn't fit any of them. They all flow under the RG to some pixel point. So 1.3, there's no, absolutely zero fitting parameters, which I think that this being biology is, uh, is uh, quite remarkable. Okay, back to universality in living groups. Uh, so this fixed point, we found it by doing experiments on uh, uh, two different families. So the order of this Three guys is diptera, which means with two wings, yes. Uh, these are two different families, and they give the same result. But for example, it would be interesting to understand whether you have the same result in Anopheles, which is basically mosquitoes. Uh, malaria mosquitoes are a big deal, like you can imagine. So we are doing experiments in here, but we are not in the field. We are in swarming room. We see great differences. So maybe it works, maybe it will not work. We still don't know. And do we expect this to be the right fixed point for starlings? Not at all. But not really because starlings are so much different from insects, but because their phase, their collective phase is different. They are in the order phase, they're in the low temperature phase, and you expect that to be ruled by a different fixed point. And uh, if we brought our horizon, uh, we have a very diverse tapestry because in this one theory, we have so many different systems in both physics and biology. So down here, the Z equal two fixed point is classical ferromagnets, would be model A. Up here, as I told you, you have superfluid helium and quantum antiferromagnets, model E and G, so Z equal 1.5. This is the, the fixed point with just activity, which is the, the toner uh, fixed point, where you have Z equal 1.7. Maybe this is what happens in uh, overdamped active matter. Okay, we, we still don't know, there are no measurement of this experiment in any uh, actual experimental system, and up here we have our new fixed point, which is the one uh, uh, important for birds, sorry, for swarms. So I think that this is really something that only the renormalization group would allow you to do. So to describe, at least to put so many different system scales on the same slide, and I think that this is really uh, fantastic. Sorry, so, I mean, your flow actually goes away. Probably. Yes, my flow goes away. I was going to ask the question, like, is the idea of inertia is that if you zoom out far enough, even if you add inertia to normal dynamics, it still looks like diffusion? Okay. Is that, is that the reason why? Yes, so the fact they, they, they're unstable, so this is a tricky point. So there is an unstable direction, which is, yeah, viscosity, if you want. So if you add viscosity, that is always a relevant operator, it always blows. Yes, which means that asymptotically, in the hydrodynamic limit, viscosity will always take over. If you add viscosity, but then you've definitely got to add the fluid. The flow, the flow no, sorry, the sorry, it's not, it's not a viscosity of the fluid. It's right. not a viscosity of the fluid. It's a friction on the spin, on the generator of the rotation. So I call it viscosity, but it's not a viscosity of the fluid. This is, uh, so you see, this is the dynamics of the spin, so, uh, which is the generator of the rotation of the velocity. So this is the irreversible part. And you have, so the two kinetic coefficient, you have a conserved one, 
which is what will be there in model G, okay? But you may have also a non-conserved one, so eta is what we call viscosity. We don't know whether that is there or not, but what we know is that if it is there, it's very weak, because the correlation function of these systems are really compatible with an underdamped dynamics. And uh, this is why we think that eta is small. So when you have that uh, uh, the relevant parameter is small, what you may have is a RG crossover, meaning that you have a crossover scale, side scale of the system, below which you are dominated by this fixed point and beyond which you flow to your damp fixed point. So our idea is that these crossovers are crucial for in biological systems because they always have finite sides. So that in particular, uh, this feature of the RG is also very nice because it tells you, it can give you answer on, uh, on finite size systems which are very important for biological systems. So, you have to take into account crossover, yes. So our fixed point has got many stable direction and one unstable, which is the friction, the, the non-conservation part. Okay, my collaborators on RG, uh, with this incredibly bright student who managed to calculate all those uh, Feynman diagrams, my senior collaborator. Uh, I have to acknowledge the European Research Council for the grant, and all this can be found, well, not the original part, but the uh, RG calculation in Swarm can be found in this paper. Of course, I never could come up with such a, a witty title, so the original title came from this. Uh, we already talked about uh, uh, Wilson, who was the hero of this talk, but it was another uh, hero, which is Michael Fisher, and uh, who very sadly passed a few months ago, so I would like to take this occasion to also remember Michael Fisher. Thank you very much.